Everybody likes the real deal, right? None of us likes a fraud, a phony. We don't like to be scammed. We like things to be like we think they're supposed to be. When I was uh, very first a Christian, new to the Lord as a senior in high school, I was involved, heavily involved in the church where the pastor led me to the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> that was kind of a different day than what you see today um, when people served in, in certain ministries, whether it was an usher or in the choir or whatever, you were always there every Sunday, every service. How many of you remember those days? I mean, you always saw the same people doing the same thing, pretty much wearing the same clothes, if I remember correctly. But uh, <clears throat> at any rate, one of the ushers at the church I went to was the dad of a kid I grew up with, and he was the husband, uh, actually, of the woman who introduced me to the pastor who led me to the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful, godly lady. And, uh, but her husband was a very short guy, totally bald. Well, he had fringe, that toilet seat hairdo thing. And uh, he, you know, just his head was just kind of shining. And every Sunday when you'd walk in, there he'd be. He'd be the first one you'd see. He'd be handing out both big smile on his face, you know, just the nicest guy. One Sunday, I came to church, and I'd been going for several months, and I turned the corner, and there he was. Only he had a head of hair that I'm not kidding you. It was, must have been that high. It was kind of like, did you ever see that movie Fletch? You know, the, I mean, it was just, it was unreal. It was like cotton candy. I mean, it was just, it was huge. Just smiling, and I'm going, what in the world happened to you? you know, I didn't say any of these things. I'm just kind of... I mean, surely he didn't look in a mirror and think, this is good. I'm liking this. You know, but apparently he did. I don't know, because he kept wearing the darn thing. And yet I'm thinking to myself, every time I'm seeing him, this is not the real deal. The real deal is about a foot underneath that. That is the real deal. <clears throat> I think we like the real deal. I liked my friend. Just his hat was what I couldn't go with. And, uh, you know, when it comes to being Christians, if there's anything that we want to see and that we want to be, it is the real deal. Believers should stand out from the crowd, not because of their politics, or because of their hairstyles, or because of their skinny jeans, or some other such thing, but because of the way they live. Their lives should look like Jesus's. That's why we were ever called Christians in the first place, right? Little Christs in Antioch. The reason that people called these folks that was because they had a lifestyle that was significantly different from those who were around them, and yet it seems like that isn't what we see. What we see is a lot of hat and a little bit of cattle, that people don't seem to be the real deal inconsistent at all. If they were living Jesus, their lives would look like his, but they don't seem to do that. Instead, what we see is people looking and acting and talking just like the rest of the world. They use Jesus' language to be sure, but they use a lot of other language as well. And sometimes that fresh water and brackish seeming to come out of the same source is confusing at best. And it does make people wonder, well, what difference does it make if a person is a Christian? It doesn't look any different to me than anybody else. Question is, what does it take to be the real deal? It's simple, really. Just live Jesus. That's it. Just live Jesus, even when you're under fire. The, the point is not uh, to live for him. There's nothing wrong with living for him. That's a good thing. But you want to go beyond that and live him, to live his life that we are in him, we live and we move and we have our being in him. It's the kind of thing that Paul would say when he said, for me to live is Christ. 
What that meant was 24-7, he was living Jesus. He was indwelt by his spirit, empowered to be able to live his life, and so you and so me. We have been empowered by his spirit, enabled to be able to live his life. But in all honesty, it seems like it's not all that easy to do that. Do you know, I have concluded it's not even easy to live Jesus when things are going well. How many people do you know, and maybe you're one of these, who you found it a lot easier to live for Jesus when you didn't have anything and you just sort of depended upon him for everything? You know what I'm talking about? You're at that point, and wow, the Lord just meant everything to you, and he was the center of your life and all the rest. But then, eh, you know, you got things going a little bit better, and, and less and less you depended upon him, more and more you depended upon yourself, more and more you became insulated from him, isolated from him, not really living his life at all. Isn't that true? It's not all that easy to live Jesus when things are going well, but I'll tell you what, when they're going sideways, or I should say when they're going against you and you are swimming upstream, when people are attacking you, it is even harder to live Jesus. At that point, I think it's easier to revert, to move back to exactly what it was like pre-Jesus, what it was like before you ever knew the Lord. You rip off the robe of righteousness, you know, <laughs> and just get right down there in the mud with everybody else. This is a cage match, dude. We're going for it. You know, and suddenly all of this Jesus lingo and these commitments and newness and all the rest that you thought that you had seem to just go by the wayside and you're just fighting with the best of them or the worst of them, as the case may be, yelling, accusing, gossiping, slandering, backbiting, punching, you know, doing whatever you can to <clears throat> take that person who attacked you out. How in the world is that living Jesus? Remember, this is the guy who, when he was abused, didn't even utter a word. This is the guy who had opportunity to call legions, thousands of angels to come and operate on his behalf. But he chose not to do that. That's the Jesus we're talking about here. That's the life that we ought to be living here if we're gonna live Jesus. How in the world do we do that? Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in the 10th chapter today. And uh, we get a huge boost from the Apostle Paul as to how to live Jesus and therefore stay in the land of yes, this place where we experience everything the Lord has promised to us, his abundant life, his goodness, his joy, his peace, even though we're being attacked. Isn't that something? And we, we see how Paul was able to pull this off and we are able to gain some strategies from looking at him. I think it's important to sort of get our heads back into the game here, understanding where he was when all this was, taken, when was taking place, when he was writing this letter to the church in Corinth. If anybody should have been unhinged, unglued, upset at this point in time. If anybody should have been attacking somebody else, it should have been Paul. Because think what he had done on behalf of that church in Corinth. He was the guy who ever planted the church there in the first place. He was the guy who brought people out of darkness into this marvelous light of the Lord. He was the person who worked his fingers to the bone to be able to provide for himself so that they didn't have to somehow take care of him and he could just meet their needs. He was the guy who discipled them, who put them on a solid foundation. He was the one who carefully and prayerfully made certain that step by step they began to grow in their lives in the Lord. I mean, this guy peeled his skin off for the church in Corinth. And Corinth was a pretty happening place at that point in time. 
wasn't like a lot of the other places he had been. These, these people had cash, they had flash. I mean, they were sharp people. And yet he was able to help them to have life like they had never known it before. They experienced the incredible grace of God and saw their sin and their sorry situations transformed. But it now had been some time since he had been there. When he left Corinth, he left led by the Lord to do what he had done before, plant churches or build up churches in their lives in the Lord. As he had spent time away from Corinth, there were others who came in who decided they wanted his place. They wanted to win the allegiance and support of the Corinthians. And of course, the only way they could do that was by displacing him, by taking him out of the picture altogether. And so that's what they set out to do. They attacked him behind his back. They said all kinds of unseemly things about him. They said, oh, well, he's a tough guy in his letters, but he's a wimp face to face. You just watch. I mean, he's not a real apostle. If he was a real apostle, wherever he went, the churches would rally around him and support him and all that. But look at this guy. I mean, he's got to make his own money just to be able to survive, and he's probably stealing yours as well. And they said all kinds of just horrible things about him and continued to spread this thing on just bit by bit. They took shots at him, chipping away as best they could at his reputation, at any positive thing that he had cache in their midst, and it was working. You know, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, over time, people will begin to believe that it's true. And that's what these people were doing. They were just constantly shredding him, shredding him, shredding him. So you would think that he should have come out fighting. You know, both guns blazing. But what did he do? He lived Jesus. That's what he did. He spoke truth in a very clear, direct way. Noting, as we'll see in a moment, that he could have gotten angry in person if he wanted to, but he chose not to go there. It wasn't helpful. It wasn't Jesus. All they needed to do was to look at his life, and his life would speak for itself. This is what living Jesus is all about. Now, in this 10th chapter, what you find is some tremendous strategy help for those situations where you are being unfairly attacked, where you are being disparaged, where you have found hurtful things happening, going on in situations in your life. What do you do to respond to that, to live Jesus, to stay in the land of yes? Well, let's begin at the beginning here of first or Second Corinthians 10, right at the first verse. Now, I, Paul, he says, myself, am pleading with you, the Corinthians in the church there, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence uh, am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intended to be bold against some, who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. All right, here's the first thing you want to understand. Recognize that the battle you're fighting is spiritual, not physical. Really important to take hold of this. The battles that we fight are ultimately spiritual, not physical. Physical. Now, there's no question that the battles we fight seem physical on the surface. You know, when somebody is in your face, that seems pretty physical to me. You know, their words and their actions have a whole lot of similarities to things I think of when I think of being physical. And so it's really easy to assume that that's the beginning and the end of the battle. It's flesh and blood and garbage. But that isn't it. That isn't the battle we fight. 
Look at the third verse, because the third verse really nails it down when he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, though our experience is physical, regardless of how it might appear, the battle we are fighting is spiritual. And we can't lose sight of that fact. We do not war according to the flesh, he says. Now we do when we choose not to live Jesus. We absolutely are warring according to the flesh. We are getting to the mud with our adversaries. We are having the cage match. You know, when we find ourselves reduced to the same kind of behavior that those who are coming against us are evidencing, there's nothing uniquely Jesus about us at all. We're just living like we ever used to live before we knew the Lord. That's why we've got to learn to discern what's going on. That's why we've got to understand that these fights that we're in, the warfare that we're dealing with, is at its heart spiritual, not physical. Folks, please get this. People aren't the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Satan is the enemy. The devil is the enemy. Yes, people allow themselves to get sucked into his plan and do his work, but in the end, he is the enemy. And we need always to recognize that, first and foremost. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 6, in the 12th verse there. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I will grant you when somebody is saying awful things about you, when they're turning your friends against you, you know, it, it looks and feels and acts like flesh and blood, and so you want to draw some blood and act in the flesh. You want to do back to them what they have done to you, but here's the deal. They're being motivated by something that is much greater than they are. And they don't get that. And they don't get where it's taking them, and they don't get where it's, what it's ultimately going to do to them. You know, you play with fire, and you are going to get burned. When you, when you allow yourself to be sucked into the enemy's way of living, it is ultimately going to destroy your life. It doesn't seem that way up front. Find me anybody who likes to hang out with a gossip long term. After a while, they don't have friends anymore. Why? Because they know that people who talk to them about other people are talking about them to other people, right? And it seems like at the time that they're sharing the trash that, you know, they're, <laughs> they're doing the right thing and all the rest, but it's killing them, and they don't get that. And we always have to look underneath the surface, and that's why repaying evil for evil will never work. It's missing the point because the problem is not superficial with a person. It's much deeper. It's set in motion by the enemy of our souls who wants nothing more than to have us fall apart, go postal, you know, lash out at these people around us just like they've lashed out at us. We're not the real deal. We're not really Jesus people at all when we do that, right? That's not living Jesus. Anybody could go there. Anybody could do that. So the, the first key especially when you're being attacked, is to remember that the battle that you're fighting is spiritual, it is not physical. Now, the second thing you want to understand is fight with the weapons God gives you and nothing else. Fight with the weapons God gives you and nothing else. Listen to this, beginning in verse 4. Four, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical, fleshly, are not. We're not fighting a physical battle. We're fighting a spiritual battle. Therefore, the weapons that we use are not physical. They are spiritual. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, for bringing every thought into captivity 
to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Just like the battle, the weapons are spiritual, not physical. Look, look at the words that he uses here because they really are criti critical. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons that we use are not physical, the usual go-to stuff, you know, that we get in with others, all the words and the wiles that we use. You know what carnal weapons are, coercion, arguments, manipulation, gossip, protests, hand-to-hand -hand combat, intimidation, threats. I mean, you know those weapons. You've all used them, right? How many of you have ever used one of those weapons in your life in a relationship to somebody? We all have. There's nobody who hasn't gone there. That's just kind of doing what comes naturally. You know, whatever it takes to get our enemy to back off because the person is our enemy as we see it. And yet, when we fight our battles that way, they're never going to end well because that's not God's way. That's why Jesus, when he was being abused, said not a word. He wasn't going to go down to that level. That isn't what ultimately was going to win the battle. Our weapons are spiritual. And when we use spiritual weapons, they have a much greater effect than anything physical could ever begin to have. Remember, the battle is being waged by the enemy of our souls. In Paul's case, what did the enemy wanted to do? He wanted to undermine the effect that Paul had had on the church in Corinth. He wanted to destroy his ministry there. He wanted to obliterate all these people who were loving Jesus, who were growing in his life. And what better way to do that than to take these people back into bondage and captivity with law all over again? And in this case, many who never were there in the first place because they weren't Jews. And so they were going to just wrap them up and tie them up so they could never have this new life in Jesus at all. And how could he do that? He could do that by means of tearing apart the things that Paul had done. In our case, it's very much the same way. He wants to neutralize the effect that we can have for Jesus. Better yet, to throw us off our game to get us fixated on some person and some problem. And the more we keep obsessing over this person and over this problem, the less we're gonna be caught up in our new life in the Lord, right? And living the life that God has for us in Jesus Christ. And so if he can get this stuff happening through rumor and anger and misunderstanding and tension, he's gonna do whatever he can to get us to go there, to paralyze us so that we can't live Jesus and be effective for him. I want you to notice here in this statement where the weapons, the, the spiritual weapons, where they focus, where they function. One place on the mind. Look, look at the heart of this statement here. You know, these spiritual weapons are the only ones that are gonna be effective to take out the ground that the enemy gains. That's what the strongholds, arguments, high things, thoughts, disobedience here are all about. What does Paul say in Romans 12? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect. It's, it's between our ears, gang. The battle is right there. You think how many battles are won and lost, all the worry, all the anxiety, all the stress, all the other stuff, it's between our ears. And that's where the enemy wins. We get sucked into these ideas, these rumors, like with Paul, this stuff that people are saying, it's all in our heads, it's not real. It's imagination and yet it's in the mind and so, he says we're going to deal with that. We don't resort to fighting fire with fire. We fight fire with the firepower of the Lord 
in the power of the Holy Spirit using spiritual weapons. Actually, look at Ephesians 6. Go to Ephesians 6 with me really quickly, if you will. Ephesians 6. And he says there, he, he points to the spiritual weapons we are to use. Verse 13, start there. He says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now look, look at this. What are the weapons we use in the heat of battle? Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the Spirit, the Word, prayer. In other words, you focus on what is true, what is righteous, what makes for peace, what is born of faith, what reflects your salvation, what's done in the Spirit, what is in line with God's Word, and you stay close to Jesus all the time in prayer. You do that and you'll live Jesus. You back away from that and you won't. But boy, you stay there in your head, which is gonna affect your heart, which is gonna affect your hands, it's gonna affect your whole life. And that's where you find the victory that God has for you. That's exactly what Paul did and that's what we need to do if we're gonna be the real deal and live Jesus. Third then, you need to remember, it's all about God, not you. This battle that you're in, ultimately it's not about you. You're not the main event. We are not the center of the universe, even though we might think so at times or might want our spouses to think so. The truth is it's all about God, always has been, always will be. It's spiritual, not physical. Look what he says here in verse seven. Don't look at things according to the outward appearance. Or do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he's Christ's, let him again consider this in himself. Just as he is Christ, so are we Christ's. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak. His speech, phew, contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we're absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, aren't wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we're not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishments, but he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Remember, it's all about God, not about you. Paul's opponents spent their time doing two things, building themselves up and tearing Paul down. Life was just that simple for them. They wanted other people to think more highly of them than they ought, and they wanted people to think less of Paul than they should. They were much more consumed by themselves than they were by God. And that is why they were obsessing on Paul because he was the one who kept bringing people back to God, not to them. Paul wouldn't go there. He just 
refused to, to speak of the accomplishments in his life as if he had been able to pull off anything himself. He gave glory to God and not to himself. I mean, look at, look at the way he talks about it here. Even the, the authority that he had. He, he wasn't a man-made authority. He didn't designate himself to be an apostle and other people didn't have an election and choose him to be an apostle. The Lord Jesus Christ set him apart, picked him out of the crowd and said, you're my man and sent him. And he realized that and he never forgot it and for one moment he, he declined the opportunity to give himself props, to showcase himself, to build himself up in front of them. No, to me, the whole approach is wrapped up in this one statement he makes here when he says, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For Paul, therefore, it was all about God. Even when he was being attacked, it was all about God. It was all about God. It was all about God. And it wasn't ever going to be about anything else. He was always going to land in exactly the same place. You know, everything looks different when you realize it's all about God. Everything. Even the battles you find yourself getting into. The devil is going to do anything he can to take you out of your game. He's going to do anything he can to knock the props out from underneath you, to get you focused on all kinds of things other than God. And let's be honest, there have been times in our lives when he's been pretty effective at that. And we've gotten sucked in and we've forgotten about God and we've focused on this person who is now the enemy or those people or that lady or that guy or whatever. And we haven't been able to just continue in the joy of the Lord, living the life of the Lord, sharing the peace of the Lord with the people around us because we weren't living Jesus anymore. But you know, when we stay focused on the Lord, realizing it's all about him, it changes everything. Folks, we've said this many times and we'll say it many times again. Ultimately, God wins. And because God wins, so do his people. It is in the end at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you have to remember that. To never forget that. Even in the heat of the battle, Lord, it's all about you. Forgive me for obsessing about myself. Forgive me for worrying over myself. Thank you <laughs> that you gave yourself for me that I might be able to bring your life to other people. It is such a privilege and it is such a joy and it is such a challenge. Lord, I just want to live you and I just want to live your life day by day by day. I tell you what, Jesus has promised that as we belong to him, he is never going to leave us. He is never going to forsake us. He's going to be with us always, even to the end of the age, through all this claptrap that people want to throw at us, that the enemy sucks them into and uses them for, Psh, doesn't make any difference. Because in the end, God wins. And because he wins, so do you and so do I. We have life in Jesus. So let's live there. Let's live Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Give him the glory. Amen. <laughs> Lord, it's so simple, I guess, really, just to live you. We want to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. It's all about you. Forgive us for losing sight of that, Lord. Forgive us for those times and places and situations where we've gotten so caught up in ourselves and some mess we have created or that somebody has brought to us 
that we have forgotten to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, that, that isn't what it appears to be at all. There's a whole other thing at work here. Lord, help us to be able to take thoughts captive to Christ, especially those ones that would take us away from you and put us onto the flesh. Thank you, Lord, that you give us not only the means, but you give us the mojo in the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. All of the power that is necessary to live that brand new life. To think that in Jesus, old things really, really can be passed away. And all things honestly can be brand new here, now, today. That is so radical. Today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, we really are people who get to live brand new lives. And we are the ones who get to live Jesus in every situation. Lord, we know that you have called us. We know that you have equipped us. We know that you have set us apart in all kinds of different places just to be your people, to be your presence, to be your hands, to be your feet. We have everything it takes to go there and to do that. And so, Lord, our prayer would be that that's exactly where we would go and what we would do. That we would truly be Jesus people who stand out because we live Jesus. Lord, I know that some who are here today struggle with that. Some go back and forth and back and forth. They sort of put one foot in the kingdom and keep another one totally outside and they can't understand why they never get traction in their lives. It's because they haven't really stepped in at all. And they're never going to find that joy in life that you have for them until they're all in. In that land of yes, that place where they are completely yielded to you, to your will, to your word, to your ways. Lord, may this day be a day when finally they step in completely. They nail that down in prayer and say, I am in and I'm not going to be any place else. Lord, I know there are some here today who have never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They don't have that new life. They don't have the means to be free. They don't have the means to rise above those things that just continue to sink them. They'd love to be able to, to know life that was beyond the arguments and the hassles and the defeats and the return to the stuff that just seems to always clobber them. And you brought them here today to give them the means to new life as they put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's all. As they put their faith in Jesus. Not even knowing what all that means, but having a sense that, man, he's telling me he loves me. He's telling me he has life for me. And if I'm willing to confess my sin, he wants to receive me and give me new life. Lord, you brought them to this place this day to give them a fresh start, a new beginning. As we remain in prayer together right now, if you are one who desires to put your faith in Jesus and to have a brand new life here today, would you raise your hand for a minute? Just raise it up. I want to be in prayer with you right now. God bless you. I see you there. God bless you. Gotcha. God bless you. I see you there, sister. God bless you. Others, get my attention, please. I want to be praying with you. Lord, thanks for those here today who are, who are indicating that they want to have that new life. And I know that as they're willing to confess you before men, your promise is that you'll confess them before the Father who is in heaven. That will be a done deal today, right here, right now. And I thank you for that in advance. I thank you for those who are finally willing to jump in, who have been one foot in and one foot out and are done with that tension that they face, never having the freedom to run, the freedom to, to fly in the spirit. And I thank you for the fact that today they're, they're willing to do that, just to say, okay, Lord, I'm all in. And for those who are, have been 
beaten up by the enemy and haven't fully recognized what was going on, I thank you for the fact that you awaken them to the reality of spiritual warfare and the fact that even today they can get victory over those things, the thoughts that have held them captive, have kept them in bondage that they'll be able to step out of that understanding into a brand new and fresh, live, free reality in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen.